Hello and welcome to the Popcorn for Dinner podcast. I am your co-host for the evening, Abu Bay, and I'm joined by Fami. We're eating our cake that we managed to grab just before the wedding turned bloody. Fami, how are you feeling? Uh, man, that cake slapped, bro. It slapped. I, my one regret is I couldn't eat, I couldn't eat more because it slapped. I mean, there was blood <laughs> on the ground at some point. Man. I, wasn't sure, I wasn't sure what I was eating at some point, but bro, it was sweet. <laughs> yeah, that's flavoring, man. That's flavoring. <laughs> uh, I'm dead. But yeah, what was, an episode! Uh, what an episode! It's uh, there are so many like points that I want to like touch on that happened. There's so much happened this episode, and the part that I've been most excited for all season is the time skip, which is happening next episode. So I'm just as excited to talk about the episode as I am to talk about the trailer for the next episode. Because that trailer uh, is fire, yo! That trailer <laughs> is whew. like it's, it's a whole new world that's coming. <laughs> yeah, literally. So a bunch of the characters are being aged up. Um, well, not a bunch. Yeah, a bunch actually of the guys that have been aged up. A few of them remain the same. You know, you see pictures of Viserys. I know, okay, I've had a very anti Viserys agenda, but after seeing him in the season six. It's because of you. It's because of your agenda <laughs> that that guy is not looking good. That guy is, Man, is the least he looks healthy like 40 something year old on the planet. <laughs> he is struggling. So, yeah, I'm, I'm officially putting away my Viserys agenda. I'm recanting all the, the bad things I've said, you know, and I wish him a speedy recovery. Think <laughs> recovery. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh my days. Okay, how about we do a quick recap of the events of the episode? Would you sure. like to go ahead? Yeah. Uh so obviously there's a lot of stuff that happened. I usually try and go chronologically and we will, but just before I we go chronology, I have to ask the question. Is Kristen a simp? Hmm. Is it giving incel 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 vibes? Well, do you think know. he listens to Andrew Tate? Because I kind of so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know if he, if if we can label him an incel, um, seeing as he chose the life, the life didn't choose him. <laughs> 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 but um, I will, I will say that um, he's a little bit misguided, in sort of a cute way, but it, it's kind of a reminder of how the world works in the in this show that we're watching right in george r. r martin's world fantasy tropes are subverted when the knight in literal shining white armor comes up to the literal princess to be like run away with me she's like bro that's inconvenient <laughs> <laughs> you know she's not like of course because sure they could they could live an interesting life in essos um people might not know them she could dye her hair you know he is already someone who's used to being on the fringes so I think they could co- they could kind of make something like that work, but I feel like she sort of doesn't do it, not because she doesn't necessarily want to, but because she is now in a position where she truly is starting to understand that the duty of the Iron Throne is something that looms larger than her, something that is more extensive than just the desire for power and control. It is about the fate of the universe because the White Walkers are a thing, Um, Which, of course, draws a lot to something from the previous episode that we didn't quite talk about last time we discussed this, which is the fact that Aegon had the cat's paw dagger carved. You know, he had that sort of engraved in such a way that you would only see it in Farron. It says, from my blood comes the prince that was promised. Now, of course, we know that the prince that was promised in this situation is somewhere between Daenerys and Jon. Mostly John, I suppose. But then, you know, things kind of start to get messy when you realize it was Arya who used the dagger, even though John brought the people together, like the prophecy said. It's, it's a whole thing. But, you know, that's, I think when she sees that dagger, when she sees that inscription, she starts to understand that, okay, I may not want to get married, but there are real things here that I need to pay attention to. And maybe it's time to stop messing around. I think yeah. she sort of changes a tiny bit. She's still the same. But she changes a tiny bit. Of course, in terms of changes, I think Alicent has now become the person that you and I know her to be. Yep. But I guess um, in, in normal Ibubi and family fashion, we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love to talk about... Um, okay, Alison's wait, origin, sorry. Villain origin story. I'm sorry to interrupt you guys. And I don't okay. want to hijack your episode, but I'm making an executive decision because I have, <laughs> I have hashtag thoughts about Sir Christine Pussycall. I have, <laughs> I have thoughts. I look, you guys, if you guys are not, you guys are listening behind the scenes, for me and we have a lot of they do their research, they have their notes, they plan everything. And I'm sorry, I just have to 
just quickly, I just have to get off my thoughts. Mad thing. Look, <laughs> every, every scene this guy had in this episode annoyed me more than the previous scene. I was you already can't blame him for oh, being. Oh, trust me, I can. I can blame him. Okay, fine. From, Let's blame him. Let's blame him from, a little. <laughs> from the boat, from the boat scene, I was already angry, and that was like ten minutes into the episode. I was already angry with him. Look, really, I like the boat scene. Like you miss all the shots is, you don't take. Look, Everything look, after look, that was. is up to something because I actually have one issue with that boat scene, because it's like you want to keep this secret. You want to kind of bring it all above board. You you know that there's danger, like we've discussed, Kristen, that you need to be afraid for your life. Like, we bo- both of us told you last week, be afraid for your life. And you're not coming, you're just coming out in your shirt sleeves from your room <laughs> to come and talk to the princess and then be standing closer and looking giggly. I'm not even going to lie. <laughs> I'm not going to lie with you. That's, you that's, a, that's a good point, but it was like bottom of my list. Look, I apologize. I'm about to be crass, but like, this is why <laughs> this is why both women should not give shitty niggas pussy. What are you doing? Are you mad? <laughs> I am the future queen, and you're coming to ask me to run away with you. Are you crazy? I have things to do and people to rule over. How are you? And he's like, you want me to be my, you want want me to be your whore? Yes. If not, go away. What is wrong with you? (laughs) Angry at me for wanting to rule my kingdom. I was so angry with this man. Like, (laughs) genuinely, he he had a solid nerve, I guess, to kind of be like, hey. Our relationship has to be above board and non-existent. Like Let's it's almost as if it didn't occur with, to with him oranges? that, that he, he what could say fuck? non-existent. He, I was like, "Are you ma-? like?" Hey man, he, he's confident in stroke game. That's it. Okay, That's but <laughs> if he's not confident, he'll be begging for her to go and live on it. <laughs> on it <with laughs> oranges and I was like, "Oh my god!" Then after that, his next scene is that <laughs> um, Alison. Who, by the way, I have thoughts on as well. Yeah, that's that's where he annoyed me. I said, it's like that's what Chris said. Me. And he's like, "Oh yes, it's true, ma'am. I, I, everything you have." He's like, "No, I said it's the ice cream." I was like, "Are you? Do you want a head yet?" And oh, like, this, no, no, is, okay, okay, okay. okay. Oh, on that one, I've been asked. I've been shouting on that about one, this for was years. Scared. He was scared. He, yes, I, I mean, obviously, for your life, but that doesn't mean be stupid. I mean, that's what fear. I two questions. One question: What changes if he? says yes it was me at the point he did or if he waits for her to actually say did you do this and then answer like because yeah. because Bunkley, i'm here for chaos <laughs> oh it. yes no it was from a story point chaos. of view but as it oh, as yes. visual, <laughs> Christine, i was like what are you doing let i, I knew it was going to do from, from that scene i was like this is what's going to happen in this scene and i was See, angry about Kristen it called me. i was like oh my Kristen god called me. he called you and he told he told me he told me that I'm, i need to make a decision now and i just told him <laughs> bro Go for the I most chaos. Peace. I all problem. I, 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 yeah, like, that's me. I just said, you know what? Just wear your armor because they might throw you overboard after such a stupid <laughs> statement. To be honest, like I'm, I'm glad that you're thinking ahead, but this was not the way so, to go about that. That's, there's something that's my that thing. It, this is in in true bankoli fashion. Like I never talk about one show, talk about another show. There's something that happens in the industry season two finale, and when Ayo and I were talking about it, we mentioned a reason. Like that's there's something that happens that we know how a character did not go to boarding school. This is how I know Christine Cole did not go to Nigerian boarding school. Because <laughs> you wait for the accusation to come and then you double down on the lie. You don't just come out Yo. in front of you before anything. I was, oh, you guys don't understand how angry Bro, I was. Anybody who knows me knows that like I was shouting when this happened because you do not answer questions you have not been asked. I was like, <laughs> like, oh it's, just, like it's, no, it's rule number one. <laughs> oh my, she literally just gave you pussy like, Two days ago, and now you're acting, you're wilding out so much. What is wrong with you? <laughs> I, I could not believe it. Like, so, so I this leads all back this to guy. the first question Is Christian a simp? He actually wants to And guy. then, and does he follow Andrew? Oh, no, he's, def- he's definitely an incel. He's definitely an incel. I don't think he's a simp because if he was a simp, he, would, he wouldn't have like lied. He wouldn't have, he would have lied for her. He wouldn't have like said. I think he's definitely he's definitely an insult. Like definitely. He like like but he like think he looks like I don't know. He's as a man who looks like he does, he should be able to handle himself better. He has had a past. (laughs) He should know how to handle himself around women. I was so I was so annoyed. I was like, how can you tell the queen to come and run away with you to live in the free cities? Are you mad? Because you miss all the shots you don't take, Bankole. We'll and look, as a man, course. as a man whose life ambition, <laughs> that's g- good shout out to the office, as a man whose life ambition is to find a successful woman and be a house husband, she gave him <laughs> the option. I was like, I'm going to marry a king, but we're still going to have our thing going on on the side. This is a man who is currently the king's guard, meaning he never even had ambition of having a family. 
that is a perfect situation. It's the best he could have asked you, for. Is, you get to be the king's guard and you can still sleep with your love who is the queen. Oh my God. Why are men fumbling the bag like this? What is going on? I was so angry. Uh, I could not believe what this guy was doing. Oh. And then the final scene. You guys, I'm sure you guys talk about it more in depth or maybe you would. I don't know. But you guys have different readings of that scene. Whatever. I think in some interviews, to be fair, Fabian Frankel, who plays... Um, Kristen Cole mm -hmm. has said that he played Kristen Cole. He believes Kristen is kind of like a thug and he's been hiding this thug all along, right? Which kind of makes sense how he explode. But you don't explode. I, I, I believe it. Why? Too. This man just came and said, obviously you guys have different interpretations, but this guy came and said, look, we're both the king and future king and queen side pieces. We just have to like know what we're doing and protect each other and like share information. Basically, we just have to like allyship here. Yeah, like, like, it's like side pieces unite. And then Next thing you know, <laughs> this guy removes his face. I was like, why? And then also, I maybe, even, so maybe the much, most right? egregious thing, he's the worst suicider ever. That's a word. He wants to kill himself by stabbing his stomach. Is he mad? Like, slash your throat. What are you he's doing? watching too many Japanese Kurosawa films. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it wasn't even a small... It wasn't, uh, he wasn't using his sword. It wasn't like his dagger. Slash your throat if you're so annoyed. Oh, I was so, I was so angry with this guy. Nah, because can't tell. Even the, the knife he was even going to use was going to be so small. I was like, bro, you're, you're not, not going to die. die. That. You're actually just going and to be in pain. Let's not get to Alicent, whose entire thing... Obviously, I guess she's meant to be the villain, and this is who you guys know as the character, whatever. Fair enough. But her entire thing is that she wasn't involved in the tea. Like, she didn't get the WhatsApp gist. Are you, like... That's how the only thing here is that she's jealous about Rhaenyra not telling her the truth about, about losing her virginity, essentially. Because Rhaenyra didn't Yeah, that is that is her main issue the, here. I think she's the issue the issue is that she's kind of evolved into her full judgmental self. Cause it's like, yeah, you lied to me, but also like you broke the rules. I think the thing with Alicent is she's always trying to herald the <laughs> I guess just the just the general benefit of the rules, even even if the rules aren't affecting Fair. her as well as she would yeah. like, she is kind of like, well, this is the way it's supposed to be. So seeing Rhaenyra kind of thrive without following the rules is kind of yeah. annoying to her. It's like all those like African aunties mm -hmm. that are always asking <laughs> people in like a gen generation, like, when, yeah. are yeah. when are you going to get married? When are you going to get married? When are you going to get married? They just don't like the fact that they're seeing these young girls with so much money thriving without yeah. without like needing a man because like they push them to get married because if they don't then it's like me who got married like this is it's kind of invalidating their <laughs> yeah, experience yeah. Not, <laughs> like, not Alison being did i get married because yeah. i would like to point out that she, basically she's well, she, in, does, yeah, she didn't she, find out she she's she mother. didn't find out anything in this episode that invalidated what renera said like not she not it's not as if matt smith came in looking all great i'm like yes we had sex everything like to our knowledge everything that renera said is still true her only anger is, like you said, rules and all that. But also, Renera didn't tell her. I don't know how she reacted if Renera told her yeah. about. I think Kristen. it's just now a case where trust is gone because she's like, oh, it's like, oh, I thought it was just them, but now it's Kristen too. So who else have you been hooking up? But with? she didn't ask. Now, she we didn't know ask Renera only, if she was left. To, she didn't ask her, but Kristen. like you know, it's still like the fact that she doesn't know what her former friend is doing, and she feels like she can't yeah. trust. I mean, from the first episode, friend. especially since she feels. Now that her dad is yeah, gone, yeah, yeah. right? Exactly. She so she's feels, alone. She's, she's alone. So vulnerable here. Like she yeah. has no allies, which is why, you know, she and Kristen forming that alliance at the end is such a potent thing because they are two people who feel like they have nobody. And like Ned Stark once said, you know, there's nothing more dangerous than a guy with nothing to lose. Yeah. And I don't. That's mm -hmm. that's a very true. Oh, that's me. You're leading to the fact that there's obviously there's a time jump, and I would say when you guys talk about the trailer, please don't don't go too much into it because some people, some people like me, we, uh, yeah, I don't watch yeah, trailers yeah. for the next episode. But like, obviously, I'm excited to see Emma Darcy and what they would do. Um, Olivia Cook and she, I, she just warmed my heart in. Um, Slow horses earlier this year, so I'm sure she's gonna be. I can't wait to see her she's be good. incredibly evil she's next half. Good. But, like, honestly, if the first season was just these guys, like, I want to know what happens the day after this wedding. <laughs> do, you, do you get what I'm like, I want to <laughs> see that story play? Obviously, we're not gonna see it, we're gonna do the time jump or whatever. But, like, I would have signed up for that story. Give me, give me the next yeah. five episodes of like what happens here, anyway. But I need to get my. I think we might be able to paint a small yeah. picture. Oh, what, what can I need to do before I leave? Did you guys like. So did you guys know about Kristen Cole? Like, did you know, know this was coming? Is it in the books? Like, did you know that this was... Because I've heard that in the books is a bit different uh, for how he yeah. kills Joffrey. Yes, yeah, so, I so plead the fifth Yes, so the way it is because... over there. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, like, I plead the fifth slightly because there's, I feel like there's okay, still more Okay, then in that case, obviously. In that case, yeah. 
Yeah, but well, I, as far as the, the death goes, um, with Kristen Cole and um, Joffrey Lonmouth, it was more a situation of like I was at a, t- at a um, tournament at a tourney. There was there was yeah. a, there was a mm. tournament for the um, f- um, for the I guess the wedding between Lena and the wedding of Lena and and Rhaenyra, and I think Kristen. W- well, not Kristen. Damon was, I think, Rhaenyra's champion, and and um, oh, Joffrey was, and and Joffrey was was champion to um to Lena. So they were kind of going together, and then everything was going fine. It was still like normal tournament mm-hmm. behavior. Then out of nowhere, Kristen Cole shows up and beats him, and nobody knows oh. why. And he hits him in the face with a mace, right? Star, and then he, yeah. yeah, and he he literally like he doesn't die. Yeah. From that, yeah. but like, but he Both dies. Six also, days Kristen later wasn't he involved. Like, how, how are you going to return it when he killed when he killed Joffrey? Like, it wasn't like a one on one. Not really. Like, so, so essentially, like Joffrey was in that yeah. tournament. He was competing. Like, he wrote he wrote for Kristen was champion, like I said, and then it, no, he oh. wasn't. Her Rhaenyra's champion wasn't Damon. It was it was Harwin okay. Strong, and for unknown reasons, like he was attacked by Kristen Cole during yeah. the tournament and he died six days later after that morning star wound because he cracked his helmet and left him comatose. So they kept the whole Kristen Cole breaks Leonard, um, Joffrey v- Lonmouth's face. Like he breaks it in and we just have it kind of more concise. And I think this is actually a really good adaptation yeah. for the show because then they would have had to do a whole new tournament. Yeah, that's, I, make, I think really cool. it makes... This basically achieves the same speed yeah. beats without them having and to do as much. And also like a really of nice gaps, piece out of it. Yeah, that's really... It makes yeah. me, exactly, and, and that's what the show has been doing, right? You know, because as as Afam has said a whole bunch of times, it's like we have different perspectives in these books, and this show is kind of setting the record straight. So it's like now, you know, t- in the histories as we've read them in this book, Kristen Cole did this for unknown reasons, but now we know why exactly he why yeah. he did it. Anyway, like, um, yeah, it, it even adds some more credibility towards Mushroom to what Mushroom said. About exactly. Rhaenyra and Damon anyway, yeah. Whole, um, I, I don't want to take too much of you guys' time. I I have more. I'm just. I have more thoughts about the fact that that, that was the woman that Damon has been insulting. I was like, Damon, do you need glasses? Because I don't understand what's going on right here. Like, is that that's the woman you yeah, insulted? It's so sad. Even the way she mentioned the whole like yeah. sheep thing, like that just tells you how infamous his comments were because he said that yeah. in the small council in episode I mean, one. Westeros is and here she girl. is mentioning yeah. me years later. Like it got yeah, back to her. Yeah. Westeros yeah. likes the because anyway, Westeros. those are my thoughts on Chris. I'm sorry for ambushing you guys, but like, yeah, he obviously he just really pissed me off. I mean, just, hey, what did you call him? Like Chris 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 Oh my goodness. Okay. That's something Logan Paul would say. <laughs> like, so, well, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's like, oh, I was like, oh, why why do men keep formally in the bag? This is why successful women don't want to be don't want to be with men. Oh, anyways. Um, yeah, you guys have fun. And please, 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 like don't collapse onto after the episode, like our boy Viserys, like keep it following Viserys' vein and it's okay. When they ask me if I need a chair, I'm going <laughs> to say everything yes. Is well, Viserys to his credit, waited till everything was done. Waited till they go back to King's Landing. Waited till the wedding till he collapsed. Like he's a man who has his priorities to his in his fairness. Uh, yeah, bro. Have you seen that guy's arm? Have was you that seen so? That back? was that grayscale. Hmm. No, it's no, basically no, no. the rot from that small Jesus cut Christ. in episode one on his finger. It keeps just festering and going up yeah. his arm, and the masons keep putting leeches. Cuts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like it, it's, yeah. it's it's basically anyway. the same thing. Like he lost two fingers, and now the whole hand is yeah. kind of just. I think like I think Re- Renee noticed that he didn't have fingers when she held his hand. I th- she hundred yeah. percent did. That's why she paused. She was like, "Ah, feel like yeah. what's maybe, going maybe on here? Well, your hand is kind of light, bro." Too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, let me not take into guest time. You guys have fun. Um, enjoy the recording. <laughs> I guess now you can skip. You can skip Kristen Cole because I've given out all my thoughts. Oh, what a terrible man! I hate you so much. Anyway, Bunkley and Mokwede, everybody. <laughs> all right. So now that Bunkley has released us from his um, the shackles of <laughs> the Kristen Cole agenda, I challenge all the viewers to go back and anytime Bunkley says I don't want to take more of your time, take a shot. Let's, yeah. let's get <laughs> anyway, yeah. so we started off. Obviously, the episode starts now that we've addressed Kristen Cole. Um, the episode starts off in the Vale of Iron, and we see um, the bronze, his bronze bitch, and she's actually quite stunning. She's like riding a horse, going hunting. I was like, damn, bro, this is not what I was expecting. The kind of person you want to hang out with, right? You exactly, know, man. She seems so sad. chill, like good vibes. Yeah, like good vibes. honestly. 
I have a whole thing on this, so let me just. Let, 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 I, I, I've been, I've been, I've been trying to just deep what has gone on here. So, um, I'm gonna try and give some context. So, first of all, one thing I really love in storytelling is when the unexpected becomes the obvious, right? Yeah. So when something occurs out of nowhere, good or bad, and it only makes perfect sense, it's a great telltale sign of like sharp writing. Why? Because yeah. that's how life works. So. Kind of to mention industry again, like Zubakule did, like in in a recent episode of industry, I think it was at, um, episode six of like season two, which has been airing. Um, it's you get this obscenely rich guy, and his son is hanging out with the person he's seeing, and then all of a sudden, that person needs a ride to a family function because the train's out of service. So mm-hmm. he calls his dad and asks him to send a car to take them to school, which is a lie, obviously. All well and good until Mister Rich Guy shows up himself. <laughs> And he's like, one car is going to handle his son's partner and then another car is going to handle taking him and his son somewhere else. And you're watching yeah. it like, of course you should have expected that as a possibility. Like, we know who this guy is. We know, like, the context of this show. We know how these people behave. Like, when you really think about it, it's like, of course this guy showed up himself because he wants to know what his son is actually up to. So yeah. I'd say, like, the same thing is kind of happening here. It's like when you rewatch Game of Thrones Season 3 and suddenly become aware of the fact that Tywin is writing and sealing letters like every other scene and Bruce Bolton <laughs> does not partake in alcohol, right? Suddenly, <laughs> it makes the Red Wedding significantly less shocking. And I, it's it's another thing here too because like Damon can't get married to the heir to the throne and become that much closer to power. Okay. Mm-hmm. He kills his wife. Like nobody thought about this, but like what what else would someone like Damon do? Like of course he's going to go home and kill his wife. And I think yeah. we just need to really address this a little bit because... Damon is, as we said, arguably like the most famous guy in the realm, right? Yeah. He has some serious accolades. People talk about his escapades and achievements, his bravado, his skill, all that stuff. And like we said um, after episode one, he's known as the prince of the city. He really gets into the murk with the people. And the fact that somebody like this could sneak into King's Landing on a dragon and get into what is supposedly the most secure room in the country, the, like the Iron <laughs> Throne Room, sit yeah. down on the throne that should be at least a little bit alarming to us yeah like, i think we were supposed to be really impressed by that and of course we were because it was foreshadowing because yeah. he literally does the exact same thing here he like think about it he most definitely flew here right his dragon is not small at all this is this is a very is big dragon very he silently unique. waited for ria royce he killed her and he left with full confidence that he would get away with it. And when he started trying to interact with her horse, I started wondering, oh, is Caraxes like his dragon waiting in the back to right. roast her or something like that? Like, it wasn't entirely clear whether he went there for the sole purpose of killing her. But mm. I think it's a little bit more than likely. And even if that wasn't his intention, he clearly saw an opportunity. And mm-hmm. that final insult she hurls at him really clinches it. Because, I mean, we've said a number of times this season that the book is based on like the book that the show is based on fire and blood is written from conflicting perspectives. Um, and those conflicting perspectives are what come to be known as the overall truth slash rumor mill. So we can see from there that in all the histories, Rio Royce's death is actually billed as a hunting accident. And since we know that this show is setting the record straight with George R. R. Martin's direct inputs, we are essentially being told straight up that Damon <laughs> not only killed this lady, but got away with it so effectively that nobody in any of the history books mentions that he was even there. Like, come on, bro. Like, this, this is this is kind of mind-blowing because think about, like, you don't really think about it when you're watching it, but bro, this man flew here. This is a small island. He flew here on a dragon and nobody knows he's around. A big-ass dragon. Like, the big these people are brutal. Dragon. I mean, there's some of the most entitled people in history. And like, that's how Damon behaves. He just takes what he wants. And like, he's really behaving very badly. And that's not, that's in no small part because everybody treats them like dragon riding deities. I mean, yeah, I promised at the beginning of this series that this was a lot more, more of a violent time in the history of Westeros. And I think the probability of that really increases with every episode. We see it reach a fever pitch here. And I think a big reason for that is that they want to prime us for what's to come. Because you know how we said that We've been watching the prologue of the prologue. Well, the prologue yeah. is starting, and it, yeah. well, uh, it's going to get Next. pretty testy. Uh, yeah, I think everyone can accept at this coming. point. Yeah, everyone can accept at this point that war is coming. I think we can all see it. Anybody who's watching can see that. Like, we're going to have some serious conflicts here. 
I hate to be the guy who says Otto was right, but Otto was right. But we'll get to him later again. Yeah. Still, though, I think, you know, it's people need to understand as they watch that it's the characters they love the most that are going to do the most heinous things. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, yeah. I think, I think that's something we need, we need to know. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I, I know, I know you were shocked at the fact that, you know, that's the person that Damon wanted to kill. I feel like she is basically yeah. the kind of person, personality wise, that is suited for him. You know I mean? Then he never even, cons- they never consummated their marriage, yeah. which is like, I mean, she's so mad at him. Like she hasn't seen this guy in what, four years? Over four years. Oh my god! Well over four years, yeah. I don't it's know. What, what did you think of that scene? Like, I, I actually, I, I liked the whole scenery and everything. I thought it was really yeah. like cool how they showed Runestone and they yeah. showed like the lines that these people have and all that it, stuff. It was very well shot. Um, and obviously it was like in classic Game of Thrones. You know, you introduce a character, kill them off like ten seconds later. It's my once god. I saw. At first, it took me like a second to realize who it was, but when she was riding, I, it was like, who are the people who are most known for riding horses in Westeros? It's and she so bad. Exactly, it's the irons in the veil. So I was like, "Yeah, this is the veil." Oh, that's her. And then once I saw the hooded fellow, I was like, "Yeah, this is where she dies." Damon actually kills her, but that was not my biggest Damon moment in this episode. My biggest Damon moment was realizing that Damon has a type. His <laughs> first person he hit on was his niece, and now at the wedding, which we'll talk about obviously later, is his other. Well, I don't know if she's his niece or niece once removed, but basically, he's the um Le- Lena like, is. Let's call she, him. Let's let's call her the his like second cousin once removed. Yeah, sure. But he's basically the generation below her because this is the same person that Viserys was complaining is too young. And all of yeah. a sudden her and Damon are having, you know, these conversations and she's a bit more She's flirting back. She's flirting back, but with I think with a lot more intent than Rhaenyra did because she's also being like, smart about it. Lena and knows like, exactly yes, what black she wants. People. Yes, you know what yeah. you want. Like she, she, she's, she's been a, she's been betrothed before, right? You know, we t- they talked about how um, Corlys was trying to betroth her to the son of the Sea Lord, which, which, yeah. which is like a real thing. And mm-hmm. in all honesty, I think that um, Lena could be um, a good match for um, for Daemon, at least mm-hmm. personality wise. Age-wise, well, I guess we're getting to a point where this is starting to become somewhat acceptable, but I'm still iffy. We'll see how I feel like next episode. Family-wise, they call the same person grandpa. So, well, yeah, they yeah. call the same person grandpa, kind they of. They so. are... Yeah, actually. They no, have no, it's... The... No, like, the, the same... The guy who is... The... great. Okay, so... They're both One's grandpa the guy, is right? the other's great-grandpather. Great-grandfather, yes. Yeah. So, Damon... Like, Jaehaerys so... is Damon's <clears throat> grandfather. He's Lena's great-grandfather. Great-grandpa. So, this family tree is now... Is, it, Branch. It's circular, like you and said. It's, it's Hopefully, it's their kids don't have life. legions on their backs. <laughs> Man, at this rate, everybody's getting legions on their back. But yeah, that was um, one of <clears throat> that was for me Damon's like most shocking contribution. But you did bring up Otto Hightower earlier, and you said that we shouldn't blame Otto or something. But no, I blame that man. I mean, I blame him. I'm just saying that he was right on some level, right? Well, he was right because he's orchestrating it. Like, it's like, exactly. it's like imagine if I exactly. go outside and I punch someone. I tell you, someone's going to punch you in the face. And then I punch you in the face. Like, yeah. yes, because I did it. And that's what it's, he's doing. It's, it's really dumb. And you yeah. know, I, I think, you know, Alicent has been made to believe that she has no power against the quote unquote natural order of things. But what if she actually tried training her son to respect his sister's claim? Like, yeah. she's being told by her father that that is not a viable option. But the two of them, the Hand of the King and the Queen, have more power than Anybody. perhaps any other yeah. two people in the country yeah. to shape yeah. the percept- the perception of people in how this should work. Viserys mm-hmm. is trying to create a situation where they get rid of male primogeniture because he says that Rhaenyra's first child regardless of gender, will be the heir to the throne. He's trying to do that. Of course, we talked before about how Viserys is not doing enough to ensure that this actually happens, right? But Mm -hmm. if these three people actually got focused, they could probably create a situation where people are like, I have to accept this or I die. There's no such thing as war because the prince himself is not going to want it. He's been trained Mm -hmm. to accept that this is what the actual natural order order of things should be because that's what he's been taught by his parents. But they don't do that because instead... You know, because I mean, the the laws of the realm would probably butt in, and they would try to go, get her to go the other way. But yeah. she has more sway over what Aegon believes, and yeah. I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna see him obviously as time goes on. He's still a toddler, but you know, I I, I don't I, I think that Allison doesn't realize any of this because she is such a rule follower. 
mm-hmm. you know, we talked about how she is judging Rhaenyra as the African auntie slash stepmother that she is. <laughs> And, you know, she is just this whole thing of I've suffered and come out well-mannered, so you have to as well. Like, the kind of person who's yeah. like, my troubles have to mean something, even if that something yeah. has to come from the dismissal of other people's happiness. Yeah. You know, it's a whole thing. And she feels she's alone. And that's why, she, you know, we get this really, really green situation. Yeah. And, you know, that I, I know that people are like, oh, that's a really good dress. That is, you know a very powerful moment and it is but it's more than that it really is an act of war because everybody on the groom side is wearing gold the targaryens are wearing their own colors Rhaenyra is wearing white because she's the bride even daemon came in uniform wearing red and black Mm -hmm. you know daemon of all people and then the queen the king's wife the queen the the princess's stepmother stepmother of the bride shows up wearing that green and the high towers you know they have this really like um muted earthy palettes you know they have like these grays these slight browns and that kind of border around green and they only really use that strong green as laris strong says when they're calling their banners to war and the other high towers obviously know what it means because hobert her uncle is like we are with you it's like and and, and you're like okay with with her for what like what are you people planning and that's how you know like these people want to start a war just and can you imagine trying to start like a generations long conflict that will span an entire continent because your bestie lied to you. <laughs> like, like, I'm trying to be sympathetic here, but bro, people yeah. are going to die, people you know? Die. And it's, it's, yeah. it was a great, like I said, great moment, beautiful dress, but you can see that sh- this is the turning point. Like this is obviously the turning point of the season. We're halfway through, it's crazy to think that we, we really are halfway through this season. But it's also the turning point for Alison's character because now she's really becoming that person. She's yeah. becoming the person who is kind of cold and calculating. We talked before about how Rhaenyra is kind of a cross between Arya and Daenerys, right? And I think now we can point out that Alison is sort of a cross, in my mind, between Marjorie and Cersei. And so far, that she's is, been a lot more is, Marjorie. That is- that is fucking she's a, she's about to become a whole lot more thirsty and people need yeah. to kind of prepare for that yeah. and this is and this is just not even be, not even because of anything that's going to come in the story this is just based on the way um emily carrie really carries that performance this um in this episode like you mm-hmm. really see her going through all kinds of emotions you see her having that emotional conflict and then we see that the conflict is sort of resolved for her when Kristen tells her what he should not be telling her you yeah. know, creating his own danger. Hashtag so, same daddy. And, and, and that's why it's easy to form for them to form that that alliance, so to speak, because, yeah. um, of course, like in the whole conflict to come, Kristen has a big role to play. And now we kind of have a better idea of what side he's going to be on. But but yeah, wh- what, what did that, what kind of spoke out to you when you were watching that? Well, I, I think it's very important to look at um, the portrayal of Alison Hightower by um, Emily Carey. And I challenge everyone to go back and watch the first episode and watch the, last, the most recent episode. Because if you remember, she was always nervous picking up her nails. And now when she walked into that throne room, that was not the same character. That person was not sure. That person character was development, insecure. baby. Character development. And that person had grown into the person who she will be for the rest of the the, the season and the rest of the show, you know, as long as that character is part of the story of of Westeros. But the, you know, there's um, <clears throat> I, I've been I've been doing a lot of thinking about forgiving Viserys for all his anti agendas, and one of the things <laughs> that um that stood out to me. So to go into the genealogy and the lore a bit more, when the old king called the Great Council to decide who was going to be the next king after he dies, it basically came down to basically two people. It was Corrin's Valerian's wife, um, Rhaenyra. Is her name Rhaenyra? Rhaenys. Rhaenys. Thank you. Corlys Varane's wife, Rhaenys, and um, Emma's husband, Viserys. So Viserys and Rhaenys. Now, the Jaehaerys' older son was the father of Rhaenys, and his younger son was the father of Viserys. So the whole claim that he's trying to push forward that this, that um, his daughter, Rhaenyra, should be the um, ruler after him is a direct contradiction to the exact same rule that brought him into power. So it's yes. almost like you can't eat your cake and have it. Like the exact same 
system which you exploited to give you this position i mean to i don't know to some degree did he exploit it or did he just like take advantage of you i don't know but that I mean, exact he, he benefited from it we can we can he benefited, say it yeah, he way. benefited from he benefited he benefited from it so that exact same system is what is propelled is not what he's trying to all, all of a sudden clean up with you know by his daughter's succession and on to his credit he is sticking by his decision to name Rhaenyra as heir, and I do appreciate, you know, standing by, you know, your daughter. But at the same time, you're not doing. You could do more to secure her claim to the throne. Like Otto yeah. said, Otto is trying to blame Rhaenyra and all these other kind of things, but it's Viserys' fault for list for falling for Otto's games and having other children to challenge his heir and. If I were yeah. Amen, I would be like, you know, I mean, if I was toxic like Amen, I'd be like, yeah, Dad, you took the throne from your cousin, who you know was older than you and was technically ahead of you in the line. So why can't I do the same? And that it's that gonna decision be a whole, is gonna haunt. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's gonna be a battle of, of birthrights essentially. And speaking Literally. of which, uh, speaking of Viserys, Paddy Considine is great in this episode. He's good. Like he's so good. He's, he's really so good. like, like I'm like Paddy. Are you good? Like, are you actually sick? You know, like <laughs> he's the whole like feeling weak, like not having yeah. not having real strength. The way yeah. that he kind of it looks so vulnerable in his room. Yeah. Towards um towards the end of the episode when he's talking to Lionel, who by the way is an excellent choice for hand, mm-hmm. right? I mean, maybe he has his own Good game decision. going on, but at the but at the very least, he's the one person who's always given giving it to him Good straight. Advice. Like, and he said it to him, like, yeah, you're right as always, because Lionel is always right. I mean, not always, I'm sure, but like you know, he's oh, well. He needs, he's a very he needs to pay attention to his Hoffney and Phineas looking at sons, but <laughs> still, I, I, I feel, I feel that that um, Paddy really captured the range of Viserys's internal conflicts in this episode. You know, yeah. we right from the beginning where he's on this ship, he's clearly seasick, but you know, it's something worse than that as well. They get to high tide, um, which, um, by the way, is you know it, it's sort of different from Driftmark as we're as we're used to mentioning it. I mean, the Valarians, as we've established numerous times, are very wealthy. Um, Corlys has picked up so many things on his various voyages, um, nine voyages as as they call them, and he has actually built this place from scratch. Right, um, most of the castles especially something like winterfell that we see in game of thrones world is very i mean most of the castles that we see in game of thrones world are very old they are very ancient and they've been around for centuries if not thousands of years um winterfell like i said is a good example of this the red keep is fairly new it's only been around like 100 years but high tide is even newer like corliss has taken the wealth that he's amassed and he's built what is essentially a modern mansion. And you can see that in the architecture. It's very Byzantine. I mean, a lot of the architecture in House of Dragon is sort of Byzantine influenced. But I think looking at the way Corliss's castle is with the spiral staircases, the colors, you can see like, you know, the blue, the seashells, the seahorses, these paintings, like it's so elaborate. And he has all these little things from his, you know, from all his journeys that are kind of like a museum to his own greatness. Yeah. And then you have that driftwood thrown in the middle, which, I mean, kind of a lore point is the fact that the legend says the Merlin King, like the King of the Mermaids, gave that throne to the Valarians. And that's the chair he's sitting on. So to kind of bring that full circle, Viserys walking in, not being greeted by Corlys, but being brought to Corlys' own throne room is a serious power move because he's yeah. still very bitter about what has been going on. And he wants to see that the king is here to make amends. The king even compliments, um, you know, the halls of high tide and everything. And I commend um, Paddy for really playing that very diplomatically. Like you can see that there's a lot going through his mind. You can see how he's kind of hiding what's going on because that that's obviously kind of a big trend in this series so far. Like Viserys just pretending that he's fine. It's like, bro, you're not okay. Like, I, yeah. do you know that we know that you're not okay? <laughs> Like you're clearly not fine, and those and speaking of which, Grandmaster Melos is a he's, he's, that guy is shady, right? It's like there's so many I know and there's this whole yeah. thing about how like the Maesters probably or potentially have been trying to sabotage the Targaryen family for many many years because obviously Westeros was a place of its own. The Maesters were an old town, 
and then like the Targaryens kind of bulldozed through everything and everybody was like okay we have accepted this as new reality but there's kind of a theory that the maesters have been trying to sabotage them from within for a long time and they may have been responsible for the eventual downfall of the Targaryens little by little because they played the long game Mm-hmm. There's a part of me that wonders if the things Melos is giving this guy are just designed to not actually help him. <laughs> Bro, how do you get a cut on your finger and now your arm is about to fall off? What is yeah. going on? Like, my part of me wants to be like, okay, what's wrong with your immune system? What's wrong with your red blood cells? But then I remember that his parents yeah. were siblings. Oh, I don't know. No, no, no. It's not just that his parents were siblings. It's his <laughs> parents were siblings. His grandparents were siblings. His great parents were siblings. were also siblings. And then the ones before those were siblings. And then, yeah, yeah inbreeding gang. So, so yeah. I, yeah, I mean, anyway, bottom line, Paddy is good. And, you know, I think we see Viserys go through a lot here. When he eventually lands on the ground, I think that's kind of symbolic as well because that's the point where he finally breaks, mm-hmm. right? And that's also the point where all the peace that has been building for these many, many years of him on the throne are going to break as well. Like, it yeah. is during times of peace that the seeds of war are sown. So that was you know, like the first line in the book. Yeah, we see that here. We even saw it in the original series. The War of the Five Kings was really the thing that defined peak Game of Thrones. Like, that's how we got those main conflicts after Ned died. And before then, there had been peace, partly because Robert was a dumbass, but we've talked about him. Um, Yeah, there's just just a lot. And I do like that Lionel is there, but let's let's talk about his sons a little bit. Um, Wait, before we get into his sons... Uh, oh wait, Lionel. Oh no, I was just talking about Corliss because before okay. we leave, because we're talking about the scene where they were in Driftmark, and I think that might actually be my favorite scene in um setting in the whole episode because the dynamics between Corley, Corley's and and Rainey's is one of my favorite. They're like literally couple goals, and Rainey literally. said something to him that stuck with me about how like the because Rainey's obviously could have been the queen, but she was passed right. over for her cousin, and, and she he's trying to get justice for her still. Yeah, but she has gotten over it. And because she can be able to see, she's not as blinded by ambition as he is. That she is, So she's able to see that the same people who passed over me are still alive now. Why do you think they're, exactly. going to, they're not going to pass over um, Rhaenyra? Like, why do you think they're just going to be so willing to And not only it? that, you're putting our son in danger. Exactly. Now you're because putting like, our son in danger. Because he's not going to thrive. Bound. Exactly. We'll be bound by whatever decision the, the, the lords and the ladies of Westeros make about Rhaenyra succession. So she's obviously hesitant. And I feel like she's expressed a lot of hesitancy throughout the, the series. She was hesitant to marry her daughter to the king, even though she agreed with the decision. She was hesitant again to marry her son to the queen because it's like, who wants to be on the losing side of the conflict? She kind of just wants to be on like on her own with her family. Let them exactly. all just live in peace. Exactly. Let's sort of break away from this whole Targaryen thing. Let's be exactly. allies, but let, exactly. we don't have to marry into it. Exactly. And I, I think that's sort of her own way of saying look, none of this is really worth it. Exactly. Like, it's not worth the stress. Yeah. But I don't think he quite sees that yet. Like, not yeah. him really out here saying, Lena will grow out of it. He's not outgrowing yeah. anything. <laughs> like, he's really not. And um, it's like, I, I think one of the, when I think about how both characters grew up, you know, Rainey's grew up the first, the only child of the heir of to the Iron Throne. Corlys, so, you know, she grew up a rich girl. But Corlys built his wealth. So it's like, from Rainey's, there's an element of content that I believe can grow up with that can come with growing up in comfort. Whereas Corlys has been a hustler. He built everything he, he has. Like you said, he built his entire castle mansion, which who does that? You know, no one does that. So it's, um, he he's like trying to go for the next step. And the next step will be having children named Valerians who will be the heirs to, you know, to the, to the Iron Throne. And that's like ambition. And yeah, he's, he's trying to go for the magis and he's, blindly be like oh yeah my son will change but like i love how rainis is able to see no that's that's not our son's nature and i think rainis is someone who like loki haven't talked about that much in the in the in the series but one of the more interesting characters in this time period of, of west Rose sea history she is probably up there in my top five characters and i love the portrayal and i'm very excited to see more from the character i think she's also a- like that we see her riding Mel- melis in this yeah, episode very that briefly. Was beautiful. that was very beautiful when the two dragons are flying in the sky it's uh i was here for it um, but yeah, you were talking about um, Lionel's son. What is it? Har- Harwin Strong? Is that his name? Harwin Brickbones is the strong one, yeah. Yeah, that look that his dad gave him when he was like, all yeah. right, they're not fighting. 
<laughs> go no, end this was, now. I was like, actually yeah. very funny because that he's was like, so he's, 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 just, he's, he's like Lana was just like, Ugh, all right. Then he just gives him that look. And then this dude goes in and starts like bulldozing through people. Like literally. Like, damn, bro. I was like, I was like wow. I mean, I guess they, they're really making good on the promise that he is the strongest in the realm. I mean, that's yeah. why they call him Breakbones. He's supposedly yeah. the strongest knight in Westeros at this time. Yeah. But I actually want to get into his brother because I, I, think, it is, <laughs> I think it is worth um, pointing Flat out foot. that second son, Larry Strong, uh, we shouldn't really take for granted the fact that he was the one who told Alicent about the tea. What are your thoughts no. on this? I It's, it's giving Littlefinger vibes, honestly. It's... Uh... He is play. He the way he just he knew what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew and he knew what to say. He knew when to say. He timed it in just the perfect time to get you know um um uh, what's her name Allison asking questions and those questions are eventually the questions that led um Incel Daddy Kristen to confess <laughs> for no reason. So it's we're just seeing like a lot of the times you treat the it's important to treat not to treat the symptoms but the source now the source of all this conflict in this episode between um um Allison and you know wearing the green dress blah 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 started with Clubfoot uh, Clubfoot is the nickname for the other strong son I'm always going to say Clubfoot I don't I don't even know what his name is but his name his is name is Laris but yeah let's do Clubfoot that, that went into one ear out the other his name is Clubfoot <laughs> But yeah, uh, Laris, I guess you know, was because I'm trying. I'm, I'm. I felt like I felt a bit for Allison in this in this episode. Her dad got fired because she chose her best friend, and her best friend lied to her. You know, so and now all of a sudden she's alone, and it reminds me of Sansa when Ned got executed. You know, you're stuck in this foreign land. Um, well, Sansa wasn't married to Joffrey, but like she's betrothed to the king. Obviously, we see it's not a love marriage; it's for duty. But she has her children, now. and the last thing her dad says to her is that you cannot. Put your children in the viewpoint where their de- their existence depends on whether or not Rhaenyra decides to kill them. You know, so he he does have a good point there, but like again, he started this whole thing, so he shouldn't make it seem like oh, it's Rhaenyra's. You know, I'm, I have my Rhaenyra agenda, obviously, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's sucky. It's 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 a it's a sucky situation for Allison, and I a part of me does feel for like the situation she's been put in, but at the same time, man, just because I. You know, war is, George talks about this a lot of time, that who really wins at a, when a war happens? It's just conflict, people die. Like, think about the War of the Five Kings. There were five people fighting for the throne, and all five of them died, like, by season five. You know, so it's like, so who won that war? I mean, the Lannis has won the war, obviously. Every like, single one of those guys died. All of them died. died. And if you look at because all of them, pull leeches into fire. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Renly's death actually was, was wild. Like, you just imagine being and a shadow just comes out. Like, what do you see? Like, it wasn't me. It was a shadow that came out from the fire. Like, who it, to believe that it, one? It reminds me of actually something that people have been saying about this episode, which is slightly different, um, off course from what you were just saying. But it's, um, you know, just the idea of, because with, with this episode, we are seeing a gay character go through something very, very brutal to advance the narrative of a straight one. Mm-hmm. And that's something that Hollywood does a lot. Yep. I think it's something worth acknowledging. Um, the reason what you're saying reminds me of this is because Renly Baratheon was a gay guy who was literally killed <laughs> by a shadow monster birthed from <laughs> heterosexual sex. <laughs> That was black magic with his brother who hated oh. him partly because he was gay. Literally, so. <laughs> that is so apt. I feel like that should be the intro. Just that, that. Frankly, like, no more like... toilets. That's okay. I went to use the bathroom <laughs> once, and all of a sudden, that's the first thing I, I hear when I take to the episode. Nah, literally, <laughs> we we've we've moved bathroom breaks to like before and after. <laughs> 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 Ain't no uh, trust in these streets anymore. <laughs> but yeah, I I I think that's something worth worth seeing. I mean, because of course there is a story reason why Joffrey should go through what he went through. Yeah. I think he made a good point to Lenor in that they should kind of understand what's going on between their paramours. I mean, it's sort of an open secret, Lenor's true nature, as they call yeah. it here, right? But Rhaenyra's own paramour is not something that was known. So once it was figured out, it's like, okay, so now we have some power in this little arrangement too. Yeah. I mean, knowing that would have been one thing. And on some level, I'm okay with the idea of him going to talk to Kristen about it. Yeah. But there's just something kind of... 
overplaying your hand about yeah, the yeah. way he did it. I agree. Because Kristen is going through a lot. I mean, we told him to be afraid of his life. Turns out he listened to us. <laughs> and he's standing there. He's supposed to be on watch. But he is, like, sort of losing his mind here, right? Mm-hmm. He doesn't know what he needs to to do to, to survive. He doesn't know if Alistair is going to change her mind and have him executed, yeah. gelded. Like, it, it's a whole thing. And, you know, this guy's saying what he says. I mean, you really see Kristen shook like yeah. after that guy walks away he yeah. he's he's go he's going through it yeah and as we we've, we've said like he he does kill him in a very brutal way but the the issue there i think is is kind of like is he treating the gay man as dispensable like would would Kristen have been as angry and as brutal if it wasn't someone like joffrey lomoth that came and said what he said yeah you know I think people are thinking about this in in the sense that, like, you know, people hoped that Lena's introduction might show that House of Dragon is doing things a little bit differently um, from Game of Thrones in terms of um, LGBTQ representation. But it's sort of like bringing in a sense of homophobic panic that we tend to see in in Western TV and, and film. You know, Kristen is rightly panicking and he's he's outraged and you know he has guilt and anxiety over breaking his oath as a member of the king's guard because he's worried that he may have done it for nothing but in the end what we have here like sto- again I, i've said all the story reasons make sense I, okay. I i don't think this could have played out any other way but i think it is worth acknowledging that this sequence still kind of shows in the end a man after being approached by a gay man that knows his secret <laughs> beating the gay man to death like literally yeah. that's the so, top line there that's and the that, that, line that's, there. that's just the thing we have to point out i mean we don't re- we don't we don't necessarily have the answers to these questions but i think it's yeah. worth sort of pondering them because yeah. they are shaping the way we view this world and mm-hmm. it's, a, it's supposed to be a reflection of our world on some level because yeah i know that i mean this podcast after with 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 this show and uh, with the rings of power we're basically fantasy for dinner at this point <laughs> as you said but so so we we do love our fantasy here but um it's worth noting as always that the fantasy in this show is structured in a way that that is mirrored in our own world so um so yeah that's that's kind of what i've been feeling regarding that i'm yeah. not entirely sure if people are necessarily all that outraged I know people are asking questions. People are a bit like disappointed. I don't know if people are straight up upset. I don't know. Did you hear anything? I didn't. Honestly, I didn't really hear anything. Also, the episode only came out yesterday, so I haven't really been on the interwebs to see what people are saying. It's like I think yeah. that there are, there are different ways to see. One of the ways that like I saw when I saw it was like it's like Will Smith and um and what's his name um who's the guy he slapped Chris Rock. <laughs> Chris Rock. You know, people have been clowning Chris um, Will Smith forever and. You know, it's the straw that broke the camel back. Camel's back. There was just that one person that happened to be there, and he just grabbed yeah. that one person and like slapped him. And in this case, he and that's why I feel like Joffrey overplayed his hand. Yeah, he he. So Joffrey had no idea what state of mind Kristen was in. The only thing, as like as an observer, like you know, who's screaming at the, what the character should do to at the TV, is I was like, wait until you see no more about this person, so you can know what's important to him and leverage yourself. But you know, at the, at the same time, it's like. William Falkland said the only thing worth writing about is a human heart in conflict with itself. And, you know, well, I'm not going to call him Corliss anymore. And um, what's it? Incel Daddy is obviously scared and he's conflicted about his position. Big man he's, Chris. Big man <laughs> Big man Chris is obviously, he's he's on the edge. He's obviously suicidal because it's almost like, this is almost like how, you know, all the school shootings, you know, just do one final hurrah, just go up, beat up someone and go kill yourself. That was his plan. Until you know, Allison showed up like you know, switch yeah. showed up. I made him switch teams like Robin Van yeah, Persie. Like he has to lash out hearts. somehow, right? Yeah, he literally just kill, has like, to lash out. Kill somewhere. Lena. I'm exactly. not going to kill Rhaenyra. Yeah. This secret has to die with me, so I'm yeah. going to die. And bro, it turns out since you know too, you're going to have to die, die as well. Too. Yeah. So but the he, way that happened, bro. Looking so at the screen, I seen a hole in this guy's it face. It was so brutal. Like I literally like. I, I, I kind of looked away and then when I knew what happened, I just went back and watched it again and I was just cringing the whole time. But we're finally at the wedding scene. We've mago mago that way and we are at the wedding. <laughs> there, maybe at some point we need to ra- sit down, list all the weddings in Game of Thrones and rank them from the most peaceful to the most chaotic. Yeah, cause, because cause weddings are always great. In it's Game always chaotic always in Game well. of Thrones. Literally, yeah. the only good wedding that I can think about 
in Game of Thrones. Up, I mean, we're thinking about like what the Red Wedding, the Purple Wedding, which is where Joffrey died. Sansa's Robin, to... Robin to Lisa, but that was very secret. Exactly, and there was one Mister, and they died for it. So I don't yeah, know if they it even literally counts. died to it from Rhaegar to uh, Lyanna. It's like weddings are just like man they always end in tears and this was another one and like the the beauty i love about like there's a lot to be said in the wedding scene we can we can talk about you know um allison's entrance we talk about viserys you know speech we talk about you know um, ha- um howling strong's older son you know um break bones be- being a badass we could talk about the beating but what i loved the most about this episode was how we started off with all these grandiose but at the end of the day after all the death and the violence it was a shotgun wedding it was literally all right, everyone, get the fuck out of here. We need a maester. We need the parents of the bride. We need the parents of the groom. Um, I think Alicent might have been there in that scene. I don't remember. And we're like, all right, mm-hmm. everyone, get married. And the second the, the vows were over, obviously, Lena was, I felt for him, man. To just sit, stand up on the front to see your partner beaten and dead in front of you. Quite literally, it's because, a... I mean, there was no way they were going to have the week-long feast that Viserys just promised yeah, after exactly. all of this. There was exactly. just, it was just not going to happen. So, he, and so he's like, happen. that's not going to happen. But... We are still doing this wedding, though, so I yep. guess we're just going to have to do it like we're in Vegas or something. Yep. Like, it's, so they it's literally just... just did the shotgun wedding, and Viserys passed out the second he was done. And I think that is the, one of the scenes that made me um, put aside my Viserys agenda because, you know, everyone is human at the end of the day, but it's like this is like the second time, no, third time, that he's planning some exact, um, um, you know, extravagant feast, and it just goes... To and it just doesn't go well. The first From time the was when he has to his wife hunt. to the hunt yeah. and to this wedding. So Viserys is... Yes, Viserys is making bad decisions, but Viserys is also going through a tough time right now. Homeboy is, and he's struggling. I mean, speaking yeah. of bad omens that are looming around Viserys, am I the only one who's not seen this rat? <laughs> that rattles. No, there's a rat. <laughs> like, first of all, it was and on I live their in bed. New York. There are rats everywhere here. I can sense them. <laughs> like, it was on their bed, and then it shows up right at the, <laughs> the, the final shot of this episode is a rat coming up to lick Joffrey Lomont's blood and oh, eat his brains. Yeah. Yeah, like that was, that what was, on yeah. earth? Because of course, Kristen was beating him with a with the hand that was wearing a gauntlet, right? So yeah, that was it was bloody, it, man. It was really like it was really like some mincemeat type of stuff. It was really it weird. Was, it was brutal. and yeah, I, I it was a whole there was no face. there was no choice but to marry them the way it happened because I mean yeah. thinking of it, why Kristen would have done what he did, like obviously there's like stakes are what keep us in check. You know, when the stakes are high, we're on alert. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like nothing really matters to a person. When nothing, when, when that's the case, like when nothing really matters to a person, nothing stands in their way, and nothing that's why lose. he he ends up where he ends up. And <laughs> you know, we now have to do this wedding the way we're doing it. Like yeah. everything is wasted. People are scared. Like I actually even want to know why, when, how the fight started. Like I don't know if Kristen was just like, you know what, to heck with it, I'm gone. That, and I think just, that's what happened. The guy, I don't know if maybe like Joffrey went and said something else, or Kristen asked him a question because this guy left his watch to start doing yeah, this. He knows that. Like, yeah. His just, head is going to roll he snapped. unless Alex he steps snapped. in. So he snapped, and I think that's why he was going to kill himself because it was like it's kind of like how Walter White goes out at the end of Breaking Bad. You know, he went out on his terms, and I think that's what Kristen wanted. He wanted to, you know, sorry, not Kristen. That's how um, Incel Daddy wanted to go out. He wanted Big to go out on Chris, his yeah. terms. Big Man Chris, yeah, he had. He was like, I think at some point in line, he realized how fucked he was, and he was like, I right, who's the last person that annoyed me? Let me grab you, let me beat you to death, and I, I'm done. I'm done. I take off my cloak and I go and kill myself um, near the in front of the old gods and go back to my maker. And then Allison comes through and pulls the switch, the, the transfer of the of the season, the a last minute, you know, like last minute just before the transfer deadline, you know, make a transfer and then she she's obviously stops him, says Sir Kristen, and that stops yeah. him. And then that's where the last. That's scene going to be him. very interesting. I remember yeah. knowing this would come. I remember. You know that first episode where he's asking for Rhaenyra's favor. Favor, yeah. And Alison is standing there, and they're both like, "Oh, this guy is cute." And I'm just like, "Wow! Yeah. If only y'all could see the future like I can." I because <laughs> I knew, because I, I knew people were like, obviously shipping Rhaenyra and and Big Man Chris from the beginning. Yeah. But the the way he was, I knew he was going to love her, but also kind of be in cahoots with Allison at some point. Yeah. And seeing how that has happened it really brings a real tragedy to it. But it does. I mean, on in all honesty, this wedding 
I don't know. We we like you said, we might have to do a bit of a ranking as as to how brutal yeah. some of these um so- yeah. world of ice and fire weddings have been. But yeah. on a lighter note regarding the weddings, I think the dance that they did was an interesting touch. I think the yeah. direction of the yeah. episode was great. It was cool. Um, you know, we've we've heard many times that the, the people in this world dance at their celebrations. You know, mm-hmm. we have references for that in the form of memories in the minds of people like Ned Stark and a lot of other people. You know, mm-hmm. so it's cool to actually see that level of dancing, people really celebrating and. Yeah. I'm sure they had to toe the line a bit between making sure it didn't look ridiculous and like also ensuring that it didn't look too modern. Yeah. You know, so I think they did a good job. And sp- in fact, speaking of the dance, God bless Ramin. I haven't said that in a while. Yeah, God bless should. Ramin. Because it's always a joy to be reminded that he doesn't just do the non diegetic sounds of the show, like the theme song and the score and stuff like that. He's also writing the diegetic stuff, the stuff that the characters can hear. So the music that we're listening to there, like, they went to Ramin and they were like, we need something that's going to be playing in this scene. And he's like, all right, cool. And then he gives yeah. them this, the same way he gave us Jenny of Old Stones, yeah. the same way Bear and the Maiden Fair came up, the same way Reigns of Casimir. Like, yeah. this man is on it's his really game. good. Like, HBO is miss. doing a good job because they have um, Ramin and they have Nicolas Brittel, like for Succession. Nicolas like, Brittel on Succession is... The two of them together, like, like literally, they're, they're, they're honestly like, like my favorite. They're my favorite composers. Like Hans, Hans Zimmer, I respect you, exactly. but these guys have my heart. <laughs> but I think Ramin trained under Hans, actually, or I, I'm, I'm like, I'm seventy percent sure that he trained under. That Hans. would be amazing, and it's possible. Yeah. I mean, Ramin is German. Yeah. Um, In fact, I'm like ninety percent sure that he trained under him. Like on some, even he he comp, he he worked with him on some of his earlier compositions. Please don't fact check me, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Speaking of um, of production, actually, um, the same person who directed this episode is the one who directed the previous yeah, one. Episode. Yeah, and um, Claire Kilner did a fantastic job with that. I yep. think she's she's been trying she's been trying to sort of point out the points of view of the marginalized. She showed the whole um, brothel scene through Renera's point of view in a way that I thought was very effective, and she's kind of showing the pain of you know. Lena in this yeah in this episode in, 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 in a very effective way too I felt for him yeah because you, you know you really see we I would have hoped that you know on some level we could see these guys just be happy just a little bit like yeah no like you you, you kind of feel like you these guys are in danger they could probably die but it's like okay maybe they'll enjoy a bit but you yeah. know you don't get to see much of that I mean we, we saw them together at like at the step zones and yeah. these are clearly skilled fighters but you know, as, I guess unfortunately it wasn't meant to be here, but still yeah. the direction was was great. It was and, beautiful. Very you know, well done. I think because honestly, a, a scene like that is very difficult to shoot. I mean, I think they did it over like ten days. Mm-hmm. There's so many moving parts. All the food on the tables was real. Yeah. Like they got like they had a specific butcher that was gonna do every single thing for them. They would order more and more meats. Like you have meats, fruits, pastries. They had a home economics person specifically there for this scene. Yeah. I mean, the banners, they use the same throne room set. I mean, they really the transformed this place. It's beautiful. It, it, and it's so immersive for the actors, which is why they're able to give such amazing performances. And that yeah. in turn leads to something amazing that yeah. we can watch. Yeah. And I like that a lot. Yeah. Speaking of amazing stuff for us to watch, um, these guys have kind of made good on their promise to give us dragon content every episode every uh, episode yeah we, we saw that a little bit it was very brief but um i there was also some great attention to detail there because rainy's dragon millie's is one of if not the fastest dragon that is around at the moment yeah. and if you watch that scene again where she and Leonor are riding to king's landing on their dragons while everyone else sails you can actually feel that speed of Millie's, um, yeah. the, um, and you can see that red dragon just like soaring through the air, like some type of fighter jet. And that was really, yeah. really nice to see. I mean, we had some nice dragon content. Yeah, uh, We're going to see a lot more dragon content in the future, if you know what I mean. But <laughs> I think, I, I, I think we have um, a lot to look forward to. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, I know you have a lot of, <laughs> A lot yes, of interesting so thoughts on that preview. Uh, <laughs> the hype like, is real right now. So, for, so how about you give the people watches, a spoiler-free analysis of what to expect? Because okay. it's a new world. <laughs> so we've we've come from two back-to-back very very good episodes from Claire Kilner, and like my favorite person, the whole House of the um, Game of Thrones, House of um, the Dragon, my favorite director, 
Mikhail Sopochnik is coming back to direct two episodes back to back. Now, Sopochnik is who did um, Battle of the Bastards. I'm pretty sure he did Hard Home. He did um the he did. the Winterfell battle. He he does the battles basically. Blackwater as well. Blackwater. He did the battle, and he did episode one of House of the Dragon. He did episode one of House of the Dragon. So he's like my favorite Game of Thrones director, and he's coming back for two episodes. The next one up coming up is The Princess and the Queen, and the one after is Driftmark. Now, The Princess and the Queen is a novella, something like that. That was the Th- that's first the original book. novella I mentioned that yeah. this is based on, where Fire and Blood kind of brings the new perspectives, but this is kind exactly. of that omniscient look. Um. So, yeah. So, um, Sopochnik is directing two is directing the next two episodes and the title of episode six is the princess and the queen which which was the original novella which eventually grew up into being fire and blood which is what the show is based off so i am full circle excited to see what happens and also we are finally getting the time skip and in the courtyard i'm not going to talk specifics on who is there and what the who the players are, but we see um, Rainier with the children in her hand. So we know Rainier has a family. We see way more blonde haired people. So we know that they're more Targaryens. And probably Aegon is grown up and all his other siblings. I think he has very petulant who have been yes. shown in the show in the show. And it's um Emma, Emma Darcy, you know, sitting at the when um Allison was like, Oh, Damon ab- abandoned the steps so the Emma Darcy's character. Like, no, we have. We we're have. all in charge here. Oh. It, it looked so beautiful. I I think there was a fight in the yard. I couldn't tell if it was Kristen yeah, Cole fighting there, someone or being fought. Oh, I yeah, I, it, look, it looked to me like Kristen and Harwin. Yeah, that would be perfect. I mean, that's, that's going to be interesting in it. Because do, do you know, actually, one thing that um, this whole thing reminded me of, not just th- that fight in the preview, but even this fight that Kristen engages in in the actual episode, it reminds me of the Battle of the Bastards and what might have happened yeah. if Sansa didn't stop John from beating Ramsay to death. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, this was on its way there. It was 21 punches, I counted. I was enjoying yeah, it. That was, I was like, yes, quite a lot good. Yes. Christian kept beating this guy. Bro. That John should have beat him more. John should have beat him <laughs> more. I liked the dog, the, the doggy dog scenario that yeah, ended yeah, up yeah, yeah. Um, devolving into. It was very because poetic. That was poetic, yeah. yeah. That whole episode of Poetic Justice. Um, but yeah, man, like this episode is beautiful and there's so many things that like I'm so excited to see what the future holds. But the most exciting part about this episode for me was the trailer for episode six and knowing who is directing it, the time skip. If for anyone here who watches Attack on Titan, you'd know that, you know, the first season or two is, you know, them stuck in the wall and you think that the world is about, you know, these monsters who just have killed every, all of humanity and and the people of paradise are the only people that le- are left. I feel like where we are right now is when they realize that is when know, say, say without spoiling it. Oh, w- when they realize that that's not the full story. So we okay, are yes, finally getting there we go. to a place where we know that the story is about to start. The prelude is over. No, the pre the prelude to the prelude is over, and now we're in the prelude for one of the most violent periods in Westerosi history. And to say it's I'm really brutal, people like is is I'm buckle up, <laughs> buckle up, buckaroo, because this is gonna be something. It's gonna be something, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to see Sim Daddy. I'm excited to see Rhaenyra grown up. I'm excited to see um, Alison Hightower grown up. I'm not excited to see Viserys in this state. I feel bad for him, but Patty's Bro, putting that man is not being there. aging well. He's not aging well. And honestly, I like her. I like um, how he's strong. He, I like him. He's a uh, He's a character that I didn't live with as much in the books, but in the show, he's been like, he's just been like a calming presence in the background, you know? Yeah, I mean, it, for him, it's just vibes. He's, he's, just <laughs> to, he's just there to enjoy. It's like, oh, I was already, I was I was, I was son of a lord. Oh, my father's hand of the king now. And I mean, one thing to point out as well, he is now a gold cloak. He's a gold he's, cloak? He, He's a gold cloak. When we when we see him in um, episode four, when he runs into Rhaenyra in the streets, he's that's actually why he's walking around. He's a yeah. gold cloak. He's he's patrolling. I didn't even notice that. <laughs> yes, and I, I think because I'm pretty sure in this new preview for episode six, he's he's wearing that gold cloak in the daytime. Yeah, yeah. I, I need to go back and, uh, and watch it again. Then I've watched it like maybe twenty times. But I, I've been fixating on some other aspects of the trailer. But I can't discuss that obviously because. I'm not going to spoil the territory, but yeah. The time will come. The time will come. Yeah, eventually. I feel like there's a point we're going to get to where I'm going to sit down and just tell in like 30 to 45 seconds a concise story about this period of Westerosi history. And 
I can't wait for that time. Yep, it's gonna be good. Yeah, it's gonna and be great. that is honestly all from us today, folks. Um, thank you so much for listening up until this point. Um, we actually want to give special thanks to everybody who's been following with us on this series. Uh, we've gotten a lot of amazing feedback. Please keep it coming. Let us know what you want to hear, what you want us to explore. Um, like, share, and subscribe on social media. Follow this podcast. We have a lot more stuff that's being covered. The Rings of Power is going pretty well um, for what we hear. Uh, yeah. Um, join us next week when we discuss House of Dragon um, Season 1, Episode 6. I will be joined by none other than Dan, the one and only Daniel Kaluuya. I'm so he glad he's not busy next week. Ugh. Oh, yeah, I know. It, it took a while to actually, you know, to organize this meeting, but it's going to be a, a fruitful conversation. We just have one week for him to watch the whole of Game of Thrones, the whole of <laughs> and then read all the books. But we believe in him. Yeah, let's hope he does. All right, later. Bye.